Today we were hunting wallaby and kangaroo for an important ceremony at the camp of the Mumurimina. A big mob of people were coming, including the big river people. We were driving the animals towards the river, as we had always done. We begin by talking about the life of Aboriginal people before any contact with other people. We spend a long time imagining how do we live on the land using and knowing the country and the land and the resources that are available. We explain that this is the area of Tasmania where you live. We now invite you to draw on that paper and put the things on that land. Draw the trees, draw the fresh water, draw the shelters, draw the fire, all the things that we've talked about. We also at that time pass around gum nuts. The piece of paper that has been decorated in some way, put it down on the map where the language group lived and then put the gum nuts on the paper, arrange them in family groups and groups of individuals, groups of people out in the bush to get a feel for belonging to that country. So at that point, uh, we've got everybody sitting around on the ground, around the map, and that's when we start the narration, that's when we start the story. Four strange craft carrying many white people came from the sea to our land. We watched them and waited for two days before gathering our mob together to welcome them. The narrator is telling the story and then the people are speaking from the perspective of being Aboriginal people themselves. On 24 November 1642, Aborigines first sighted Abel Tasman's ship off what is now called Frederick Henry Bay. History tells us that Abel Tasman discovered Tasmania. As the narration continues, the boats start to arrive, and so the person who's doing the actions actually brings a boat, and the boat has buttons on it, and the buttons represent the European people. First of all, the ones, the, the Dutch and French, who are curious, but then later when the British government actually made a decision to move here and take over the land, it was a very different story. And there are ways of trying to get that message across without speaking. We pick up the gum nuts and throw them into the tin, and sometimes that sounds like a gunshot. And then the person who's doing the actions takes the paper and starts to rip it. And particularly the first time that happens, it's a shock. But we believe that in, in the power of being involved and being participatory, it's, a, it's an appropriate shock. Our people are frightened and angry. They've already taken a lot of land and our food. They seem to want more and more and yet offer us nothing in return. We thought the white people might have stayed a little while and left again, but it seems they are here to stay. And so the story unfolds again. It's a long story, um, but more and more land gets taken away, more and more Aboriginal people die, more and more British people arrive. And then eventually there was an attempt to collect, round up, do away with what remained of the Aboriginal people who are, are still around in the land and to make promises that could never be kept. This is a very sad time for us. Our elders are dying with all of their knowledge. Our babies are dying before they grow. 
An important part of the whole process is actually demonstrating that it's not just about people dying, it's also about like the impact of dispossession. There's a lot of toing and froing. There's a lot of change of policy that results in Aboriginal families being moved around. That happens within the living memory of people who are still here. And that part of the story is really important to tell. And the way that we do that is actually ask the participants to move from one place to another. It was hard moving to Oyster Cove. We were left knowing that many of our people had died at Waibalena. At least at Oyster Cove we can hunt and fish in our own way. It's great to go on hunting trips as it means we don't have to go back to that awful place for weeks at a time. The strength of the culture that can continue through such abject dispossession is really strong and meaningful. And so if the whole of Tasmania and the Tasmanian people and maybe the people of the world have a better understanding of the stories of the Aboriginal people as told by the Aboriginal people. It helps us to think, well, you know, we have a dilemma. What do we collectively want to do with this information in order to, to change that story? Because the history that was taught in schools has not been representative of the Aboriginal people who have been here for thousands of years. When we reflect on the past, we remember the hurt and sorrow our people have suffered. Public apologies, recognition and acceptance are part of the healing process. Creating a new future where our history is known, our culture is respected and our children are proud to be Aboriginal is important to us. If I want to be culturally responsive, my first job is to use the resource that has clearly had an impact on people over probably the last 20 years and to familiarise myself with that, ask myself whether I can do that for myself. My next job is to figure out how I can work with an Aboriginal person. And so the first place to go to would be Aboriginal Education Services because I know that we can source the Aboriginal Sharers of Knowledge program. And then, I guess, taking the plunge. And so we really hope that more and more people can do that. <laughs>